I want to talk about the techniques that you used for the underwater parts of episode four. Um, we don't get a lot of opportunities to talk about that with DPs because a lot of DPs don't really do it. So uh, you just had this opportunity in episode four of um, Lovecraft Country, and I'd love to hear about how you approached it. Yeah, I mean, I didn't actually obviously do the underwater operating myself. I've got operators. We brought uh, guys in who do that all the time. Sure. Having said that, uh, once upon a time, I used to because back before the days of video assist, I'd get an underwater operator. They'd set, you'd tell them, describe to them exactly what you wanted. They'd go down with the underwater housing. They'd shoot it. They'd say, did you get this? Did it was like this? Did you get this? And they'd go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you get your dailies back the next day. And it didn't look anything like that. So I got so frustrated. I went and got my diving ticket. I learned how to do it myself. No and I way. just started doing it myself. And then I knew if I had it or not. But that was a long time ago. You know, it's a whole different ballgame now. And I've got also I've got a lot more... Um, you know, plates to keep spinning when you're on a production this big. And, and obviously this set had a, had a massive soft light built above it because there, you know, we couldn't be, you know, doing a lot of specific lighting. So our overall sort of basic fill level came from this very, very soft, slightly blue soft light. I had them keep the, the tops of the tunnel open, knowing that if we did catch them, uh, this effects would, would fill it in because it, it would have been, if, if they're absolutely totally enclosed tunnels, it, it would have been, um, we'd have been in there forever and it wouldn't have looked very good. And interestingly, one of the things we encountered that you normally don't run into, um, we had the, you know, the latest underwater housing for the full on Venice camera. Um, but the problem is to, for the actor's comfort, obviously the water had to be heated up. And they had it pretty warm in there because they were going to be in it all day. And the crew, were, we were going to be in there. I mean, I was, I was in there, too, but I didn't, um, you know, I wasn't sort of stuck there for, for 12 hours like a lot of them were. So the water was very warm. And the result was that the camera in that underwater housing overheated. And uh, mm. my my first assistant, Steve Early, had the genius idea of he ha he quickly got the drivers to go and get us some dry ice. We opened the housing up, packed the bag with dry ice, closed it up, and that way the camera wouldn't overheat. Because underwater housings are made to use in the ocean where it's never an issue because sure. it's cool. It's not, it's not you know, 98 degrees um, or 102 degrees or whatever whatever they had it at. And um, that solved the problem, which was, you know, it's I, I think that's typical sort of film crew thinking, you know, you know, solving, you know, finding solutions to problems in a hurry. And, and, yeah. um, and I, I, I got to give, you know, take my hat off to my grip crew who, who did an amazing job. And they, they actually, for all the, for all the work working on the water, they came up with a, um, they cut a boogie board and had a half and made a little catamaran. And we put the airy maxima stabilized head on it, put the camera on that. And then the dolly grip could, could push it around through the water, no matter how, uh, rough the water got the camera stayed perfectly steady because we didn't wow. we didn't want to go we didn't want to get into too much of a handheld kind of ropey feel um because we just felt like we were a bigger classier show than that but it was the only way to get into these tunnels and the operator re operated it remotely and that thing worked like like just great